so where we go astray is when we say there is nothing else but competition, there is nothing else but thinking, and so on. The, the great ones knew that the heart has its reasons of which the reason knows nothing. And I think that we have to take some uh, wisdom from that and take it seriously. And then, you know, that's the balance. And that's the balance. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It is a great pleasure to be talking with a renowned scientist, mathematician, thinker, philosopher, actor, producer, <laughs> <laughs> author. He wears many hats, and he's actually coming to us wow. from where uh, you know where I got to start in a certain sense. My father was a was a math PhD at UC Berkeley, and uh, worked very closely with Jim Simons. And that's how they met, and that's how the Simons Observatory came to be. Uh, but we're not here. We're not here to talk about my favorite subject which is me. Uh, we're here to talk with <laughs> Edward Frankel. Uh, Edward, how are you today up north? Um, doing great, Brian. Good to, good to be here with you. And thank you for that. For this generous introduction. Yes, yes, it's all it's all true. Uh, so your legend has been known to me for many, many years. So we have mutual friends uh, like Eric Weinstein and uh, Stefan Alexander. Uh, and I started to become aware of you uh, originally back in 2015, 2016, when I started to think about writing a book. And I came across your wonderful book called Love and Math, The Heart Thank of you. Hidden Reality. And it was really shocking to me that a math book, even though I'm the son of a mathematician, uh, that a math book could be so fascinating and so touching and personal. So I want to do the thing you're never, ever supposed to do, which is to judge a book by its cover. That's that's verboten. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but we're going to do it. So I want you to explain, hold up the book, explain the title, the subtitle, and what that beautiful image is meant to represent. Well, you know, uh, I, I can take credit for the title, but I cannot take credit for the cover, cover for the cover art. Uh, it was really uh, a stroke of, of genius by the, my publisher, Basic Books. Um, so the cover depicts um, a fragment of the famous painting by Van Gogh, A Starry Night. And uh, they chose it, and I was just like, wow, this is great. Now, this was not totally random, because in the book, I do say that Van Gogh was my, my favorite painter when I was a kid, so I was exposed to his art early on. I remember my mother took me to a museum, the Pushkin Museum, um, art museum in Moscow when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, and I was absolutely fascinated with Van Gogh's paintings. They had a very good collection of impressionists in general. But somehow I was just drawn to Van Gogh. I was just like standing in front of those paintings and just totally mesmerized, you know? And so that that affinity, that love for Van Gogh kind of continued. Uh, I discovered other artists and so on, but it, it's still up there for me, one of <laughs> my favorite, absolute favorite artists. So I guess maybe the artist who designed the cover for the book read that passage or something. Also, it's about, what is it about, the study night? It's about sort of looking at the world, at the universe, and appreciating its beauty, and asking questions, what, 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 where does this light come from? Uh, what, what does it mean? What does it all mean? And I think all of us have a memory of an experience of that nature, when we were, you know, kids, maybe when the air was not as polluted, <laughs> especially for people of our generation. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself up north, up there. <laughs> Crystal well, clear I, down here. Oh, really? Well, good for you. But you know, I remember with the, as a kid, I, we went on a on a on a on a trip, you know, like a hiking, like a, you know, with, with with backpack, but backpacking trip was my with my classmates. I must have been fourteen or something, and I remember we were somewhere in a village in the middle of Russia, and. I saw the the night the starry night sky it was unbelievable. It was like wow. It was just like really made an enormous impression on me. So I guess uh, that cover maybe communicates some of that also. That sort of that like unspoiled innocence sense of beauty and mystery of the universe, which I guess I I, tr I try to convey in my book as well. Mm -hmm. Now the the title. The title is kind of interesting because I people kept asking me why did you did I choose this title Love and Math, 
and and I <laughs> I didn't know when I was writing. Sometimes, well, you're you're an author, so you know that sometimes you only later come to appreciate and understand what you write. Sometimes you just try to kind of, you know, people say sometimes channel is something. I don't want to go all mysterious on you, but I, it is true in my experience that I, um, rereading the book years later, I was like, I wrote this? Really? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I pos- now I can see the meaning of it, which I could not possibly uh, consciously appreciate at the time that I was writing. So, you know, when people ask me after the book was published, uh, what does it mean? What does the title mean? I would make some kind of jokes. I would say, you know, love and math have a lot in common. Um, It's easy at first, but then it gets awfully complicated. (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) But then later on, I kind of to appreciate what it means to me. It is like, uh, it is a new iteration on, on the um, eternal theme um, that we have as humans. This sort of um, balance between uh, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, the sun and the moon, uh, Apollo and Dionysus, the left brain and the right brain, uh, logic and intuition. So to me, love and math represent like these two pillars of humanity, you know, mm. the, uh, on which um, we, we kind of, which on which we be, uh, our life is based and sort of our life to me is a kind of a, unfolds in this sort of infinite spectrum between those two polarities and in a way um, the older i get uh, the more i kind of become interested in the question of how do we find balance between the two how do we start how do we find in in, a, in our personal lives but also in our life uh, as a, as a society you know mm. so that's what that's what this title represents to me yeah. and you mentioned the subtitle is is the heart of hidden reality which is which is uh, similar in some sense to a book by Brian Green uh who's not been a guest on the podcast but he, he assures me he will be on someday mm-hmm. um so in the context of string theory so that kind of hearkened to me this quote by my hero, uh, as my listeners are probably long suffering uh, from from hearing about, but Galileo Galilei, I was actually just in his prison slash house a couple of weeks ago in, <laughs> in Arcetri, Italy. And Galileo said something beautiful. The book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And he considered himself a natural philosopher. That's what we used to call physicists. And I, I want to quote a different physicist, mathematician, Eugene Wigner, who gave a lecture at New York University in 1960 called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Mm-hmm. And it sparked a debate that continues to this uh, to this day. How could it be that mathematical concepts purely of the human mind, and we'll talk about the great debate, yeah. is math invented or discovered? But for example, mm-hmm. he mentioned in the statistical distribution of populations, uh, which we have for voting and, and all sorts of aggregations, appears the the ratio of the circle's circumference to its diameter. What the hell is that doing in there? Um, <laughs> so, how do you react? Or, or the sum, or the sum of inverse squares of positive integers, like one, one plus one over four plus one over nine plus one over sixteen, and so on. Yeah, if you want to do it yourself. Thumbs up to pi squared over, over four. Right. right. Sorry, pi squared over six. Over six. <laughs> You're just a mathematician. My father yeah. of blessed memory, he used Four, to say, six, don't ask me to calculate a tip on a on a yeah. bill because I'm a yeah. mathematician. Mathematicians are the worst with the tip, you know, it's the worst. So never never try to divide the bill with the mathematician. No, never do. So what so, does that quote mean to you? Why is math so uh, effective in physics and in the heart of hidden reality, making yeah, it way, illuminated? I, I quote, I, I use this quote on page two of my book, okay? Yes. <laughs> so, yes, you, you're asking so you, is it the right question. What does it mean? Well, there's so many layers to this, you know. But um, our, our Western society is built on this idea, which is a very powerful idea of analyzing things and um, ordering things. And... Um, Actually, I would, I would trace it back much earlier than Galileo to, to my hero Pythagoras, who mm. was a great Greek uh, mathematician and philosopher. So he said, all things known are numbers, right? So there is this impulse um, to, um, to represent things, to analyze things, to put them in, as part of a system. 
And ultimately, it means actually representing things by numbers and find and representing the various connections that we observe and uh, between things as equations and as formulas and so on. Right. So, so Galileo. So then, for a while, that 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 thread, that theme, which to me signified sort of the birth of Western civilization. We're talking about twenty five hundred years ago, give or take. Uh, for that, for a while, that thread was kind of went kind of not silent, but kind of quiet, and it was picked up by you know, in the Renaissance and people that followed, and especially Galileo, and that eventually led us to Descartes and to the Industrial Revolution, and here we are, you know. So um, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and then he, he says uh, for those who don't, and, and the, the letters, the, the in it are circles and triangles and. and Geometric figures like that, and those who I'm, I'm paraphrasing, those who are yeah. not aware of them are are bound to wander in a dark labyrinth. So, in other words, it gives us tremendous capacity to innovate, to evolve, to progress as a species. One might say, you know, as a humanity, as a species, to create all these technological wonders and so on. Also, brings us a lot of grief. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I say we have built so be these beautiful cathedrals, but also bombs to yeah. destroy those cathedrals. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's always like, you know, uh, in, in one motion, the, the my mathematics gives and takes away. And that's where our wisdom needs to come forward and to help us to discern, to understand, to see the limitations of knowledge also, the dangers of um, uh, logical reasoning run amok with, uh, when it's not supported by love, by, uh, by connection, by compassion, you know? And so I think this is where we find ourselves um, a, a few centuries after Galileo, 2,500 years after Pythagoras, in a way reevaluating these um, words, these maxims that they instructions that they have given us i think we have taken them maybe sometimes a little too literally and maybe time has come for us to show more maturity and more wisdom in appreciating that mathematics is not everything it gives us a lot it is a language of nature but there are other aspects of nature that are just as important mm -hmm. does it make sense yeah no, it does. And and actually, it seems to me that we fit the language of nature to the needs at hand. You know, for example, Galileo was very close to getting the inverse square law, but he couldn't quite get it. He got this law of, of squared times from, you know, dropping things down. But then we remember he didn't even have clocks back. I mean, they're, they really were dealing with very primitive physical entities. And if we fast forward, you know, 400 years uh, from Galileo to Feynman, Feynman then refines the statement and says, uh, calculus is the language God speaks. And, you know, these are very yeah. breathless things, but, you know, great physicists, great mathematicians. I'm, but do you, do you feel like we find the math that we need for the time? In other words, could we find, sometimes I hear, oh, string theory is the math of the 22nd century that fell into the 21st century. <laughs> well, I, look, I mean, I, I, here's the first thing that comes to mind, okay, when you're asking this. And again, there's so many layers to this. And I, yeah. I hope, I hope we'll talk about that. But here's the first thing that comes to mind: is don't you find it fascinating how people usually speak about? So it, it used to be it, it, one of the ways is people say God is things they don't know, but they don't understand, and they say right. it's mysterious. That was sort of the paradigm in the years past. But what I find more often today is that people speak of what is God is what they have mastered, what they have understood, or what they feel they have understood. So. I have understood calculus, so calculus is God. It comes from God, and that's the, that's the essence of, of things. And that's the core essence of that. Oh, I understood things theory. Great, this must be the grand unified theory of everything right. because I have understood it now. So, what else could it be, right? So, I'm like, don't you find it a little a little bit strange? That yeah, it's kind what of you have learned, right? <laughs> you know what right. I mean? It's like. Mm, coincidence <laughs> or right. not or like should you be a little bit should we have a little more humility to say just because i've learned this 
doesn't mean that I already know everything or I'm close to knowing everything. And in fact, if you look at history, every time somebody went out and said, we have now mastered it. This, oh. this must be the mess from God. And that's basically all there is. They are put to shame. So the famous quote from Lord Kelvin from around 1900s, when he yeah. said the edifice of physics is basically finished, and only two little problems. The Michelson, Mike, Michelson Morley experiment about the speed of light, which of course we know led to Einstein's relativity. That's right. And the radiation of the black body, which led to quantum mechanics. Okay, just these two little things. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll understand everything. So I am a student of history. I would like to be a student of history and say, what it shows to me is that every time I have this impulse, and it's a very natural impulse, nothing wrong with it, to say, I got it. I should put, I should hold myself back and I should not allow myself this type of hubris to, to, to say that that's it. That's what it is. So, yes, maybe it is part of the story. It is a part of some design or you know, it depends on your sensibility to what extent you want to, how friendly you are with the mysterious, so to speak, and how much you want to emphasize it. But I would like to, I would like to believe and hope actually that I don't know. Most of the things I still don't know. And in fact, why I say hope? Because I think life would be boring if, in fact, everything was known or we were close to be to the point where everything is known. So, no, we are not close. And that's good because that means that there's so much more to discover. Mm. There's so There's going to be so much more joy going forward of learning more things and mm. saying Eureka all over again, you see. Right. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. But on the other hand, mathematics to me is inexhaustible. So sort of continuing the same line. So in other words, whereas physicists sometimes, in my opinion, no criticism intended, succumb to this idea that they are chasing this ultimate theory, that somehow the ultimate theory is possible. And sometimes they say, okay, well, we'll come up eventually with a theory where all the main equations can be written on a t-shirt. Right. It sounds like a great, you know, motivator, but I think in mathematics is different. So if you're a student of mathematics, and I, I, even though my first love, as I explained in my book, was physics, I really wanted to be a theoretical physicist right. and study quantum physics. But uh, due to various circumstances, I actually went um, in, a diff in a slightly different direction. Uh, I went to my into, to mathematics, and then eventually I came back and I and I have collaborated with various brilliant physicists, and so I, in many ways I'm a mathematical physicist. But my upbringing is as a mathematician. When right. you study as a mathematician, you never hear this from your teachers, you know, from your mentors. We are chasing the final theory. No, because there is no such idea that there is a final theory. Mathematics is inexhaustible. It's limitless. It's infinite. So the progress in mathematics is is infinite and eternal, and you always continue to discover new things. And so for each era, for each epoch, if you will, its own mathematics, its own emphasis, you know, uh, on, on the particular area of mathematics. Hmm. And I wonder, you know, pivoting from that, uh, if when I look at some of the most, you know, kind of gratifying or beautiful things in mathematics that eventually in hindsight turn out to have applicability in physics, I can't think of anything more kind of surprising or spectacular than the fact that we have these, you know, classical commutation relations between position and momentum in classical mechanics and Lagrange's theory and, you know, back in the 1700s. And, and you take that theory and you just add in the square root of negative one and a little constant called H bar, and you get uh, the quantum commutation related which don't commute and so the, the poisson bracket or the, the key point the key point is non commutativity though right so right it was the brackets that those guys wrote they were poisson bracket yes so you have a commutative algebra but you have a certain operation on the commuting quantities they're still they're still numbers they're still or numerical they could be functions but well valued in numbers and numbers commute three, three times five is 15 and so is five times three but uh, in fact, I think it's kind of an accident. What happened is just because we use numbers of like whole numbers or rational numbers or real numbers so much, and they commute that it's natural for us to believe that the world is commutative. And the greatest, uh, one of the greatest um, 
how to say, um, breakthrough or, or, or uh, sort of like uh, discoveries in quantum physics was that the world is actually non-commutative. And as a mathematician, if you are a professional mathematician, you know that most, al most algebraic structure are non-commutative, which means that AB is not equal to BA. And, and of course, uh, I usually explain it by saying, you know, if you put socks in the, on and then shoes, it's not the same as <laughs> doing That's it. right. The other way around, or a, 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 car a, a carriage be be before the horse or after the horse. These are two different things. So that's non commutativity And the point is that at the very basic fundamental um, level, our universe is non commutative mm -hmm. So that was the big discovery. That was a big jump, uh, the big insight. Those guys in classical physics, they still can thought that everything's commutative. Classical physics is commutative. And there, but there is a germ of non commutativity already because you know that to write down the equations in a Hamiltonian form, it is useful to have this additional structure, which is called Poisson bracket. And like you said, you know, uh, the, you can think of passing from classical physics to quantum physics, quite what we might just call quantizing Poisson bracket, where right. instead of commuting quantities, you suddenly now have non commuting quantities, such as. Uh, momentum and, and the coordinate. And this non-commutativity is really at the core of all the paradoxes and all this weird and strange behavior of, of uh, in the subatomic world, you see. So, uh, but you're right that mathematicians already in, anticipated in some sense, even yeah. though they could not possibly imagine that it could be taken this far. That's where, that's where you have to appreciate physicists. You have to appreciate people like Heisenberg, who actually discovered this non commutativity without even knowing mathematics involved, which had been um, uh, constructed, can, can, had been uh, theorized 100 years earlier. I, but I'm talking about this, this theory of matrices. So matrices, when you multiply them, they also don't commute. And so Heisenberg just driven by experimental results and trying to build a new theory which would explain them. Right was was and he was in this famous you know, the famous story was an island where there were no books, no mathematicians, which may actually be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no department yes, chairs, yes. no department. No chairs. department chairs, no committees to you know to go to. And, but also the point is, he actually invented matrices. Yeah, how, how cool is that? So there are some fundamental structures in mathematics which are inevitable, and which are brought upon us it, it, eventually by physics. Same with complex numbers, by the way, square root of negative one that you mentioned was theorized by mathematicians, uh, you know, in the 16th century, but then uh, make their appearance in quantum mechanics through Schrodinger equation and other things. So my, they are also woven into the fabric of the universe. And my conjecture that you'll probably laugh at is, uh, is what if you had all these things, uh, you had, uh, well, I mean, as, as we just said, you know, Bomboli, I think it was, invented the complex algebra and the rules of it. He is a contemporary um, of Galileo. So Cardano, I mean. Cardano, Cardano, oh, Cardano. Cardano, but... Gerolamo Cardano. At least he wrote, I mean, there were several people who talked about it, but he wrote it in his book. Uh, right. He introduced then, complex numbers there. Yeah, and then Descartes and, and uh, of course, Euler and, and all sorts of other right, people right. got into it. But right. um, but the but the important thing to realize, they were contemporaries with Galileo, not, not with, like, right. Heisenberg. That's so right. what I wonder is... You know, this is my controversial proposal for the podcast. So right. could you look at all the mathematical structures that are known to exist and mm -hmm. say, let's we'll pick the Lang Lang's, Lang -Lang's program, <laughs> say mm -hmm. there must be some physical instantiation of the of that. Some, I mean, you called it a grand unified theory. We don't have to get into that. But um, but as a, as, a, as as a little tongue in cheek, because I know, uh, I know, right. but but as, still, as close, comes, yeah, I did, I did. Yeah, yeah, if you'll humor me, what if you looked at all the just put all the no, mathematics that's a very in front of good question? Yeah, so could you discover new physics that we don't know about now? Okay, okay, so again, several things that yeah, yeah, you are you are inspiring me to, see, to think in several directions. So, first of all, I would say, my you may be may well be right that these examples, the first mm -hmm. example being. Uh, square root of negative one and complex numbers being theorized by mathematicians just abstractly in order to, but not completely abstractly, in other words, there was a reason to try to find uh, formulas for solutions of quartic equations where these square roots naturally appear. Um, so then they pop up in quantum physics and they are fundamental to quantum physics as we now realize. Yeah, and then quaternions and Hamilton. Quaternions, they then, um, then Poisson brackets and stuff like that. And so uh, non-commutativity and so on. So that 
one one might uh, lead one to speculate and to conjecture that maybe all of mathematics somehow will find its uh, a proper place in the natural world in the world around us in physical reality. May well be true. I know. I at the moment I I am inclined to think otherwise because mm -hmm. simply because mathematics is just so enormous. Yeah, and so the, there are certain. Um, um, there are parts of it which seem to have no connection whatsoever, but it may well be my own limitation and my own prejudice, you see. So because immediately what I'm starting to think are things like um, Hilbert space, infinite dimensional vector space, and then, oh, wait, that's an essential ingredient of quantum physics already, okay? So it has already right. found its place. Okay, okay, bad example. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> periodic numbers, so there are these counterparts of real numbers, which are called periodic numbers, which are uh, uh, give us a different generalization of rational numbers, the fractions of integers. And I, I, I was going to say, they haven't found any uh, place in, my, in uh, physics, but I just remember that a couple of months ago, I was actually looking at some articles by physicists who are trying to um, feed them in some models of, of quantum mechanics, also mm -hmm. quantum physics. So they may actually may well be yeah, relevant. So be. I would say I, this is one of those cases where okay. I would say I don't know. Very okay. good question. May may well be true, but <clears throat> maybe not. So because you know, in the end, also, uh, it's possible that mathematics is just a kind of a has a certain uh, um, not necessarily focused on the or pegged to the physical reality because it is a kind of a. Um, activity of the mind, right? So in a way, one could also say that it, it's like a Venn, di a Venn diagram, so where you have an overlap between the two, but the two subjects kind of like uh, uh, develop on separate tracks. Mm -hmm. Right, they may so not. That, <clears throat> and um, there was something else I was going to say, but anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I want to run by you, because, you know, we, we don't have that much time, but, but you know, I, I can't resist talking about, you know, in, in both string theory and in uh, inflationary cosmology, which is what I study experimentally, uh, there's a notion of a multiverse. Uh, in, in string theory, it's typically called a landscape, where you have all these different instantiations mm -hmm. of vacuum energy level. And then, mm -hmm. um, and we often, and then there's a multiverse of many universes. And if you know one thing about it, typically in both scenarios, there there's a claim that there'll be different laws of physics. There'll be different laws of physics in multiverse, you know, uh, universe number 65,012 versus 65,011, you know, whatever. Or in the string landscape, you know, where there's an infinite distribution of vacuum level. My question to you is, um, could it be that in some of those universes, uh, the laws of math are different. In other words, why why should it be that just changing the vacuum energy density changes the speed of light, C, or Newton's capital G, or the electronic charge or fine structure? Why couldn't it change the ratio of the circumference uh, to the diameter of a circle? Why, why couldn't it change modus tollens? Um, uh, could you see a, a scenario where a multiverse of, you know, mathematical universe, not in Max Tegmark's conception, but, but really that you'd have different versions of mathematics in different universes and and could maybe we could use that to rule out such a such a fantasy well i think again i don't know mm. but my, I'm, I'm i'm inclined to think that that's not possible um that mathematics is universal in some sense so that even if there are many universes um in fact you know, i used to do this thing um i would uh, sometimes start uh, an, um, give talks and i would talk about this universality of mathematics and i say what if we meet aliens which i guess now has become sort of like yeah. much more much closer to uh, the realm of possibilities that's right uh, what if we meet aliens and we start talking to them right is it possible that they actually have different mathematics and i, I like to illustrate it with one example where people say for instance one one counter one way that i heard that people would articulate the possibility that they would have different mathematics they would say there would be the following argument for us, mathematics, for many of us, mathematics starts with numbers, with natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Yep. Why? Because we see multiplicity around us. Hmm. You know, we have, we see many people, we have seen, we see many trees, you know, we have, uh, you know, we eat strawberries, and there's several strawberries, uh, several uh, of them. So it's natural for us to count. But what if you have um, a kind of a civilization or which only has one entity, which one conscious entity, like in the movie Solaris or the book by Stanislav Lem, Solaris, you know, where it is a planet which is conscious and it doesn't have 
any any other solar there are no other solaris in its in its world right so then it's not you say okay it's not natural for solaris type intelligence which is one which is unique to to think in terms of numbers so they would do different type of mathematics so it's not even the question of mathematics contradicting two different mathematics structures contradicting each other but just sort of developing it from a different place and to, 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 to this and i think this is a very interesting point where actually one could articulate that the two it's possible that they would start from a different place but they would still meet with us mm. and the, the way i illustrate is by saying that numbers can be discovered uh, solaris intelligence could discover numbers through what mathematicians call homotopy groups so to, to explain this think imagine i wish i had a my flow a floss handy so imagine just taking a floss and wrapping it around your finger okay mm -hmm. so you can you can you can wrap the floss around your finger once twice three times four times and so on this is how a finger could discover given a floss could discover um natural numbers even if there were no other fingers around by wrapping things you can wrap things around several times and actually it's much better because this wrapping in some sense does j more justice to numbers because each I'm an experimentalist oh, have I'm a, i have i have some floss yeah okay. I, I need to. i have it in my <laughs> so you're saying a homotopy group is a homotopy class is the number of in windings this case, it's number of windings and so but actually see it's much better so number one these windings you can really see that they are equal whereas if you have a, a, a bowl of strawberries it, no two strawberries are exactly the same right. so you actually you may have a hard time convincing a child that they should be counted in the same progression in the same mm -hmm. sort of like uh process you see but when you wrap things around it it does look like the this winding it's the same and you also realize negative numbers not only positive numbers because you can also wind things in the opposite direction mm -hmm. and i've never seen minus five strawberries you see so in other words <clears throat> I, 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 Likewise, you can also wrap a sphere onto itself. It is harder to, um, to 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 find a prop for that. But mathematicians have a, a theory of what's called homotopy groups. It, it's it, it, where it's we sort of go one dimension higher than the previous example, and you can also wrap a sphere onto itself, and you can wrap it any, any positive number of times or any negative number of times. So an advanced Solaris intelligence would be would naturally be led to this type of um abstraction of wrapping its own surface onto itself and mm. discover numbers as a as an as a winding number as a as a number counting how many times it wraps on itself uh, so to me th this example illustrates the unity of mathematics that the same concept can arise from different um fields of mathematics in this case from topology slash geometry and from number theory proper where you're actually just counting things but the, the concept of numbers is sort of on the intersection of this and there are many other ways to get to, to natural numbers it's like you were saying earlier about pi how interesting that pi appears as the ratio of a, of a well that conference. was Wigner yeah I can't take credit that was Wigner so that, not me Eugene Wigner okay well <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to take credit for Wigner and you can take and you can get also pi from formulas for voting uh, for yes. statistical distributions and also, as I mentioned, although I, I mispronounced the, the, the answer, is the sum of inverse squares is pi squared over six. You see, so pi appears in, in, in this variety of ways. And likewise, every mathematical concept. So this actually is brings us to this idea of language programs. So I think for me personally, I was, I've always been interested in this idea of unity, of how you can get the same things from different parts of mathematics. And so language program is actually about that. Yeah, could you uh, could you do the favor of you know it's kind of like having uh, you know uh, having a rock superstar like uh, like like having Mick Jagger here and say don't you don't have to sing Satisfaction you know don't worry about that so come on you're the you're the you're the foremost I, master you know, of it's but, funny it's funny you it's funny you mentioned that because I just had a conversation about exactly this song with a friend of mine with an artist and he was saying you know can you imagine Mick Jagger he's done it so many times and he's still doing it like how yeah. can you possibly do it so many times and i said but he explains to you that he can't get no satisfaction he <laughs> gets the satisfaction when he's singing the song <laughs> that's the whole point it's in it and that's I, right know, I, I said it I, I, I didn't know where it came from it was kind of an insight which i just had in that moment so you know it's kind of like this so i get satisfaction by explaining 
what <laughs> this program is about. <laughs> I like Mick Jagger. Yeah, right. Well, thank you for the comparison. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, well, uh, it's exactly like that. So it's like you get in natural numbers or whole numbers in two different ways from two different fields of mathematics. So I would call this a kind of a baby version, an example, a prototype for unif- unifying different parts of mathematics, number theory and topology. Where topology would, uh, you know, reference this general idea of things like winding and wrapping things on, on itself and so on. Uh, but in Langland's program, in the, the, the original uh, connection was bet- between the number theory and what's called harmonic analysis, which is Harmonic analysis, basically, you can uh, you can appreciate it by thinking about the sound of a symphony uh, uh, playing a, a, a piece of music uh, as being um, a kind of um, superposition uh, of different notes of different instruments. So different, a note played by a single instrument is what we call a harmonic. So it's mathematically represented by a sine or cosine wave, but they have different frequencies. And when you put them next, when you combine them, you can actually create sounds, uh, very sophisticated sounds, which are much more sophisticated than the original sine and cosine functions, right? So that's the idea of harmonic analysis. And so what Langlands um, imagined, or what he saw in some manifestations, in situation, is that some difficult problems of, harm- of number theory, where you're basically counting things, like counting solutions of some complicated equations, polynomial equations, could be uh, recast as a problem in uh, harmonic analysis, where the answer could be uh, found in a, um, in a much more straightforward way. So kind of much more easily solvable problems. Mm-hmm. So that was the original uh, formulation. And you could say that the, the way I talk about it is like he established a bridge between two continents of mathematics, number theory and harmonic analysis. And there is a pattern. So it's not just a random connection, but there's a particular pattern where certain structures arise and then similar structures also appeared in other areas of mathematics, like geometry and, um, and representation theory, but then also in quantum physics. So in quantum physics, there is this idea of electromagnetic duality, where um, amongst those equations in vacuum, they're just invariant and they exchange electric and magnetic fields, even though they have very different manifestations in, in the physical world. And uh, if we try to see if that holds in the quantum world, we would have to accept the existence of what's called Dirac monopoles, mm. uh, particles which carry magnetic charge. Haven't been observed yet, as far as I know. Right. Now, I have a video about that. I'll link to it above here. We did a video about the Valentine's okay. Day event of ni- 1982. Uh, collaborator at a uh, friend at uh, Stanford, Blas Cabrera, uh, claimed he detected the monopole, because Dirac said you only need one monopole in the whole universe to explain the value of the quanta of the electric why, charge. Why, why electric charge? Because quanta is such a beautiful mathematical argument. Well, Dirac was a genius in yeah. uh, very beautiful mathematical arguments. But, but um, so interestingly enough, uh, electromagnetism is what's called the gauge theory. So where the group uh, governing this gauge theory is called U1. It's a circle group, a group of rotations of a circle. And uh, But we know that there are also gauge theories corresponding to other groups. For instance, the weak interaction, weak force, is described by gauge theory, in which the group is called yes, U2. So it's a group of two by two matrices, unitary matrices determined one, and so on. And the strong, strong interactions, SU3. And so on. And so physicists wondered in the 70s whether there is an analog of electromagnetic duality for those gauge theories. And they found to their astonishment that if such a duality existed, and now I have to say that these are not quite realistic models because they are what's called uh, supersymmetric models with maximal supersymmetry in four dimensions. So don't quite, uh, don't quite correspond right. to the real world, but not too far. Kind of like mathematical formulations, very similar to the realistic models. What they discovered is that if electromagnetic duality uh, holds for such models, then it would not be between the model and itself, but between the model and another gauge theory uh, in which the group is another group, which actually turned out to be the la- what we call in mathematics Langlands dual group. And that's one of the biggest mysteries of the Langlands correspondence is that the symmetry group, it gets replaced by this other group. And then suddenly physicists find the same phenomenon in the electromagnetic duality. So that's a kind of astonishing, you know, surprise, you know, that first of all, it sort of cuts uh, to, to several things that we have discussed. The connection between mathematical discoveries and discoveries in physics, 
but also this unity that there's certain phenomena which appear in many different branches of mathematics and physics. And to me, that signifies that there are higher levels of understanding, higher levels. So mathematicians, you know, in 100 years or 200 years will just look at things differently. They will see, you know, in a way, what we perceive now as different fields of mathematics is just like different projections of this much more multidimensional um, subject. It's like, you know, if I take this, this, this cup and project it onto the floor, I will see a disc. But if I project it onto a wall, I will see a rectangle. So it's like number theory manifestations of the cup would be like projection to the floor. And we, we, we see them as in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, manifestations in geometry or harmonic analysis or, or mathematical physics would be projections onto the wall. But in fact, the subject itself is so much richer. And when we discover, oh, it's actually a cup, it's actually a, 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 a teacup. And what we were looking at before were the projections. Mm -hmm. There is projections of it. That's why... These mysterious connections, they are not longer mysterious when we see them manifested inside the cup. Yes. See. Excellent. Well, before we turn to the uh, to the uh, existential questions, I have one more quote from uh, Wigner. Mm -hmm. He said, mathematics is the science of skillful operations with concepts and rules invented just for this purpose. The principal emphasis is on the invention of concepts. Seems to me he's definitively answering the eternal question of whether or not mathematics is invented or discovered. And I've asked Stephen Strogatz, I've asked Jim Simons, I want to ask you, um, is mathematics invented or is it discovered? Yes. Uh, well, I knew you were going to ask this. <laughs> you know, I, I used to really think uh, deep and hard about this. And But my understanding, my feeling or my intuition about it, because obviously there's no proof either way. Right. Uh, maybe there will be one day, but we don't have proof today uh, or either way. So it's more of a speculation. It's more like intuition. My intuition of, of it has evolved over the years. I, I used to be squarely a Platonist. And when I say Platonist, is it me, in, this, in this context, it means that uh, you believe that math, math, mathematical objects live somewhere outside of space and time. Mm -hmm. So in, in uh, love and math, I have I you know I sort of I, I have sort of waxed of romantic about this en enchanted gardens you know of number theory where Maris Galois went and brought us the flowers you know these Galois groups and so on. Mm -hmm. So I was really seduced by this idea, which I thought was a very romantic idea that there there is something outside of this world. And mathematical when you do mathematics at the as a professional, uh, you you get exposed to so many things which unfortunately our uh, math education uh, doesn't let most people to see. And it really looks so uh, incredibly dazzling and fascinating that it's and not linked to the, to the physical world at our current understanding, right? That right. you start, it is very natural. And I would say most mathematicians are closeted uh, Platonists. They wouldn't <laughs> tell you maybe directly. Maybe they whisper if you know, if you are friends with them. But they will not tell you directly because it sounds like, it's like a bad form to be like a mystic, you know, to right. say something like that. But most people believe that that is the case, that there is something weird about mathematics. It is not all of it. Not, it's not true that all of it comes from the physical world around us. But there is something be, be beneath the surface, okay? And I was very firmly in that camp. Mm -hmm. But what I think now is a little bit different. So what I think is that actually it's one of those cases where there is not an objective answer. It depends on how you look at it. So, for instance, and to give you an analogy, this happens in quantum physics all the time. For instance, you ask, is an electron a particle or a wave? And the answer is, it's neither and both in some sense. Right. In other words, if you set up an experiment in one way, it will manifest itself as a particle. If you set up an experiment in another way, and this, what I'm saying is something very well known and very, uh, you know, one can Google it and find out exactly what I mean, that double state experiment. If you set it up in one way, the electrons will behave uh, as particles. If you set it up with a detector behind the slit or so on. And if you set up in a different way, it will behave as a wave. So what is it, a particle or a wave? Is this cup a disk or a, or a, or a rectangle? N neither. It is something else. So it is something else. It's beyond those those concepts. And what we observe, as Heisenberg said beautifully, is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. In other words, the yes. method, uh, nature, which we have put in a particular context of our experimental protocol, if you will. And this experimental protocol can, can be changed. 
and then nature will expose other sides. And sometimes the sides seem contradictory to us at this moment of evolution, where these things seem to us as contradictory um, in nature. But in fact, for nature, nature is more is much more mysterious than we know at the moment, in my opinion. That from the point of view of nature, higher point which we have not yet reached, there is no contradiction. Just like there is no contradiction in the fact that the cup projects onto a disc in one way, projects onto a rectangle in another way. So same for me today about the question if mathematics is invented or discovered. It's like electron, it is a particle or a wave. It depends on how you ask. It depends on from which angle you look. It is like Bohr's complementarity principle. The two properties seem to be complementary. But I think it's both. There are some elements, in other words, there are some elements in mathematics which were uh, discovered. Mm. Uh, where, but if you look at it in a certain way, if you look another way, they are invented by humans. But who are humans anyway? Who are we? Who mm. are we? Who are, who are you, Brian? Yes. <laughs> Do you know who you are? <laughs> yes. Depends who you ask. <laughs> in the, yeah, exactly. The point is, in the end, to me, it actually leads to, and, and this is where I, I'm not being facetious, I'm actually being serious. These questions are useful. This question about, is mathematics discovered or invented, and so on, they're useful. Just like a question, is a human being a robot, a, a thinking machine, and so there is nothing but a sequence of zeros and ones. Or a human is a human being a collection of particles and nothing else. And, and I know that many of our colleagues, very brilliant ones, who subscribe to these ideas. But what I'm, I'm not trying to say they're correct or they're not correct, they're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. But what it reveals is what they think about who they are. So all right. questions, ultimate, all questions of that nature, we can call it metaphysical questions, we can call it philosophical questions, or whatever. They ultimately, we have to appreciate that they are, they, it's, there is a reveal when one speaks about it. Uh, a reveal is that in fact, it leads, they all lead to one question, like all roads lead to Rome. And that question is, who am I? Who am I? If I think that I am a sequence of zeros and ones, then I will believe that the world is a computer simulation on somebody's computer and so on. And then I will believe that uh, something else about the, what the mathematics discovered or invented. Mm. And if I, do, if I think of something else, then I will, so you see what I mean? So these discussions are very important. But I think at sometimes we have to also make the next step and actually ask the question directly, uh, which my friend uh, Nassim Taleb, mm -hmm. which, who, by the way, uh, uh, speaking of the cover of my book. Oh, yeah. Also, the black wrote, Swan himself. Yes. The, he wrote, he gave me a beautiful uh, blurb that if you are not a mathematician, this book might make you want <laughs> to become one. <laughs> so Nassim has this thing which he calls skin in the game. Okay. So it's all fun and games when you just talk about things abstractly, which we are used to in some ways as scientists. We pretend that we're talking about the physical world, but its electrons are weird and so on. But nothing has nothing to do with me, you know? So that's like no skin in the game. You're just, you're, you're, you're removing yourself from your, from your world. And quantum actually, to me, shows that you can. That's the whole point. That's what Heisenberg meant when he said, what we are observing is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our... Uh, way, uh, method of questioning it or method of observation. You're always involved as an observer. Right. Quantum physics proves it, okay? So that's skin in the game. So let's have skin in the game and let's ask those questions too. And I know you're asking me now, so that's why I'm giving you the answer. <laughs> and maybe on that last uh, topic before we wrap up with the existential questions, um, when we hear in physics that there's only a few years left before we have artificial intelligent physicists, artificial Galileo, Galileo, or uh, artificial Einstein, A I A E. But I always like to point out that good old, you know, Albert Einstein. He uh, he had a very famous quote on his on his most famous discovery, which was that uh, which he called the happiest thought of his life, which was that if an observer was in free fall. They would experience no yeah. gravitational acceleration. Right? Equivalence, equivalence principle. Exactly. But I want to ask you, Edward, how can a, how can an artificial intelligent computer A have a happiest thought? What does that even mean? And B, how could they relate to the physical visceral sensation of falling? It seems impossible to me, but I want to ask you in the context of mathematics. Is there mathematics? I know that there's obviously lots of chess and and so forth, but I, I'm actually not as interested in you know, whether or not computers can beat humans at chess. I want to know, or shakmati, all right? Uh, but I want to know, can a computer invent a game like chess? Uh, I don't seem to feel like that's possible, but I want to know what you think. Right. That, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. So, and that's one of the questions which leads to the question, who am I, right? So that, 
who am I? Do, do I believe that everything in my life is programmed? Uh, so in other words, can be um, ascribed to intelligence, to logical thinking, or do I believe that there are things in my life which go beyond logic? You know, Blaise Pascal, no less, was a very smart guy, and he was a great scientist and mathematician. He said the heart has its reasons of which the reason knows nothing. That's right. The heart has its reasons of which the reason knows nothing. And all the great ones, they knew about it. All the, they, that's how they felt. And you could say, well, Pascal was a long time ago, so he was a religious man, perhaps. And so Einstein is on record saying the most important thing in science is the mysterious. And uh, I'm paraphrasing, the one who doesn't see it has their eyes closed, you know? And so they're not really doing their job in some sense. Not to mention Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, I have already quoted, and so on. So these guys knew that there are other dimensions in life other than thinking. Call it intuition, imagination, which, by the way, Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, and so on. Except so, if you go to the dentist, uh, Edward. You know, you go to the dentist, you want him to have some knowledge or her to have some knowledge, not... But see, so here's this what, creative thing on your teeth here. Here's what Edward Frankel uh, adds to this uh, discourse, okay? So here's a thought experiment. Let's suppose... Uh, uh, sometimes I use it when, I, when I'm asking some questions, so I, maybe I'll, we'll close with that. Let's suppose that AI today... Artificial intelligence, whatever you call it, computers, whatever, you know, computer, neural, neural networks, which, by the way, oh, my God, neural networks solve every problem, really? And it's based on 19th century mathematics. What about the 20th century mathematics, 21st century mathematics? Right. Doesn't sound, sound a little odd that none <laughs> of that is useful? Come on. <laughs> but let's suppose that neural networks, AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, today can cover 99% of all human experience. So let's suppose, ask yourself this. Excuse me. Ask yourself this: What is more important to you, this ninety-nine percent, or the one remaining one percent? Right. Yes. Ask yourself this, and well, where I stand on this probably is clear from what I said earlier. Yes. <laughs> uh, to me, the most interesting part in life is that which is not captured. Right. Now, to get to that, you may actually have to do a lot of computation. But there is a moment of awe. There is a moment of insight. There is a moment of when you reach the peak. And 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 see the beautiful valley which is opening in front of you. Does it is it covered by ninety nine percent or one percent and so on? So I believe that we will progress and we will maybe cover more and the, in ways which we cannot now imagine. Computation, logic, reason is one of the basic major human impulses, and wonderful. Look how much great stuff we can do with it. Mm. And I, obviously, as a professional mathematician, that's that's what I do for a living. Where we go astray is when we say there is nothing to, to life but computation. There is nothing to life but thinking. And so we should just do more thinking, and then we will solve our problems. Well, first of all, the history of, of, of civilization shows that's not the case. Right. Because even if you are so thinking, maybe other people don't. Uh, I'm not subscribing to that, number one. But is it everything in your life based on thinking, really? You really always make decisions based on thinking? Well, congratulations. <laughs> I'm glad you do, but I have some serious doubts about it. And if you are honest with yourself, maybe you will remember a moment or two when your emotions took over, when your intuition over, over was overriding your thinking, and so on. So where we go astray is when we say there is nothing else but computation, there is nothing else but thinking, and so on. The, the great ones knew that the heart has its reasons of which the reason knows nothing. And I think that we have to take some uh wisdom from that and take it seriously and then you know that's the balance and that's the balance mm -hmm. yeah between love and math that's the balance between love and math right there right there all right, I want to ask you one rapid question and one uh, and then one longer question just to finish up for a minute response but the one uh single word answer I'm gonna ask you now Edward you ready love or math choose one well, and then in the next breath, I say, don't have, don't choose one over the other because we go astray also if we go too far on the other side. Mm. I've seen people do that too. And I don't want uh, to do that. You know, I have a wild side, <laughs> which can sometimes... Yeah, you can see it on the internet, folks. You can see a, a hunky mathematician named Edward Frank. <laughs> so what I am, uh, what my practice is in some sense is, uh, or what, what my goal in life is to, Find the balance between the two. I think uh, I, today we spoke. I spoke more about the dangers of being imbalanced or going too far on the side of math. 
But I have to say that the same is true. If, if you go too far on the other side, it also. And sometimes, you know, we play, so we can go. Sometimes we go get ahead of ourselves, go, go too far. But we have to remember and come back. And I think that's where we are at our best as human beings, as individuals and as a society. When we are both, because, you know, we're best when we, we use both hands, not just one, but both, you see. That's and right. so think of this as, as love and think of this as math. And so, you know, <laughs> bond them together so much when we do both, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't think of anyone else who's more uh, superlative at doing that and communicating it and doing the most uh, far reaching research that the mind can even grasp. I mean, just to go through. Uh, some of your research and preparation. It's its just so fascinating. Edward, I hope we can meet in person. I, I've, we've never met in person. We're in the same university system. Next time I come I up to Berkeley, uh, I will stop by to see you, my friend. Yes. Uh, for now, I want to thank you so much for going into the impossible. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 